Um, the fundamental unit of, of uh, the reporting unit of, of the uh, urban nutrient management aspect would be uh, acres in the nutrient management plan. Um, with the different, uh, and again, it, you don't necessarily have to have all of these, but you would have to hit a majority of them to be qualified. It's a little bit of a judgment call with the urban nutrient management planners uh, that would be at the state or local level. Um, again, each state is going to be different, um, just as maybe in some of the other practices, particularly with this one. Uh, different states are going to rely on different agencies. Um, from cooperative extension through, uh, you know, potentially uh, even just plain local governments. Um, and, uh, you know, many might rely, like the Master Gardeners program, which I think most of the states have. Um, and uh, again, the, the basic uh, unit would be the plan. Um, but we also envision um, that there could be a, a kind of smaller or, or shorter and simpler version of the plan, which would just be a pledge that homeowners would sign um, that they're going to implement these practices. Um, the plan qualifies potentially for the full credit, back to that chart that was in the earlier, I forget what slide it was earlier on. Uh, I guess the pledge is roughly half of that. Um, and then also, uh, uh, in all cases, there has to be sort of a, uh, we just call it expert here, but um, again, state designated uh, individuals, whether they be cooperative extension or if they designate master gardeners or whoever, that would be uh, uh, signing off on the plans and, and sort of reviewing those or the pledges. Um, Back to that, that diagram that, uh, um, that uh, Neely had, uh, that Stu Schwartz particularly worked on showing uh, in sort of varying risk factors. Uh, a very simplistic version of that is that, you know, your lawns uh, could be either in a low risk or a high risk situation. It's important to remember right now in the, in the watershed model, because we're, we're back to that, of course, uh, that all pervious land loads the same at this point. I guess you could say it, it is the blended rate. Um, and so the idea of low risk and high risk is introducing a new concept. Um, I'm not quite sure at this point um, uh, from a bay-wide model standpoint whether in the new version of the model we're actually going to get to mapping uh, completely low risk and high risk. So introducing it here, um, uh, you know, maybe a bit of an issue, but the thinking is that if you're doing a plan, of course, on a high-risk lawn, you're going to get more nutrient uh, reduction benefits, so that's a 20% reduction versus doing on low risk. I think, and actually, in a lot of, uh, from a practical standpoint, uh, you know, states or local governments who's ever doing the reporting here, or s locals through the states, will probably just be doing it on the basis of a, of a blended rate. Uh, and, and not potentially trying to characterize between low and high risk, but there is that option there. Uh, and that, you know, that, that line at the bottom is, is, gee, that's a BPJ line. Uh, we didn't really, again, go out and, and measure this exactly. And, um, you know, in the future, hopefully, as more information is developed uh, from a land use, land cover standpoint, perhaps, uh, uh, Perhaps we get that one better. Um, so again, on the phosphorus side, uh, the credits are roughly, I think they're all half what they are on the nitrogen side. And, um, uh, you know, there's, there's sort of two reasons for that. One is, I think, throughout the whole watershed, um, uh, all the states qualify for a statewide phosphorus reduction already. And so this is, again, sort of in addition to that. And secondly, uh, of the 10 practices that Neely showed you earlier, I think, what is it? It's only about three or four of them that actually apply to phosphorus. They sort of all apply to nitrogen, but only some of them apply to phosphorus. So uh, again, you're just not going to get as much reduction from a nutrient management plan regarding phosphorus at this point. Um, 
Again, uh, this is sort of gets into the verification aspects that uh, Norm and others will, will comment further upon later, but um, um, the plan itself must be you know, prepared, again, by whoever the state is designated as their plan writers or trained experts. Um, consistent with the, uh, the long care practices, which I don't think means that you have to do all 10 of them, but again, you have to be consistent with the basic message or the basic points in each. Um, you know, from a verification standpoint, you're going to document when it starts, uh, and I think they're, they're potentially good for three years. Um, this is going to be tough at the local level. You know, it's not quite like a, a nutrient management plan at the farm level where you might have hundreds or thousands of acres. These are going to be fractions of acres. But the, the owner, um, the acreage involved, certainly, um, the, the fertilization rate, and again, that high or low risk, that's an option. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that in many cases we'll be going just back to the blended rate there. Uh, and ag yeah, again, so that under the verification framework, we're proposing that these plans are good for three years. Um, they could be renewed, uh, again, based on affirmation from the owner uh, that they're, they're keeping going with it. Um, if, it, if they're not renewed, they drop out of the model. Um, and um, I think there's more in the next slide, but we're also proposing that there be some checkup on these, um, you know, particularly for larger acreages in the plan. Um, again, sort of the data that would be in there. Uh, let's see. Um, there's one that, that uh, uh, Neely didn't catch in your, in your um, uh, comments there. I, I, that's NEIN with a, I forget what that stands for, Matt, but it's N-E-I-E-N in there. Um, but again, this would, would potentially you know, be tracked back through the state using the NEIN nodes to the Bay program. Uh, Okay, and, and again, we're also proposing, and this is going to be tough, I think, but that the, um, again, the Urban Nutrient Planning Agency, whether it's, say, the state or, you know, potentially down at the local level or even a, a third party like a watershed um, organization, would at some point have to, again, we don't figure they're going to check up on every single plan, which, you know, might be hundreds or thousands potentially, but that they would uh, check a subsample of those um, you know, basically try to verify that, that the practices in the plan uh, are, are being followed uh, and then use the, uh, that, that, that subsample uh, to sort of re reconfigure um, uh, the extent of compliance with their total number of plans. Uh, yeah, I don't know where that is. That, that's... Uh, that's Norm's future uh, housing development site, perhaps. Um, Neely went over this again. It, you sort of break down the credits into the ones at the state level and then the ones we've just been talking about, uh, nutrient management plans, which are at the individual site um, homeowner level. Um, and uh, just a little more background on that. Um, you know, what we did was we, we tried to actually be conservative. Uh, you know, in the model, um, uh, phosphorus loads uh, largely from fertilizer, on pervious urban land, largely from fertilizer, although there's a little chunk of it that, that comes from other sources. And so uh, we asked Gary Schenk at the Bay Program to give us the numbers for if you zeroed out phosphorus, uh, which is essentially what a P-band is, uh, and then, um, um, what, we, we, what we then did on top of that was back to Neely's comments about the, the research showing, again, that phosphorus bans are not 100 percent, whether you want to call it cheating or just the fact that there's still phosphorus around in, um, uh, like, southern states, my pl favorite place to shop. You can still go buy 10, 10, 10 or other materials and put it on the lawn. So we conservatively took Gary's numbers for zero phosphorus application and, and took that back to 70 percent. So uh, if you take 70 percent of, of the uh, 
And, and of course, this only applies to pervious land, so that's why the, the overall total urban land, which is both pervious and impervious, has a different number, and it also varies by state, probably based on the percentage of urban land that's pervious or impervious. So again, it's, it's a fairly conservative number. If you looked at that research, um, it would show you that uh, at least the one study out in, I think it was Wisconsin or Minnesota, that you can get um, changes in urban land in the 10 to 15 percent range uh, with a phosphorus ban that included some cheating, but uh, again, we were just a little bit more conservative than that. Um, yeah, I guess that's, these are the original numbers at the full rate, and this is at the 70 percent rate here. So that's the, the, the credit uh, at this point, although uh, that's going to potentially change uh, based on the verification for all these statewide credits. Um, on the nitrogen side, at this point, um, there's really only one uh, state uh, that currently qualifies based on legislation, I guess, passed last year in Maryland. Uh, so this is sort of currently the Maryland um, uh, fertilizer law credit. I think maybe other states might move to um, uh, do, do similar things, and, and there'll probably be a process, maybe back through the watershed technical work group to sort of verify that what they may put in their um, uh, regulations uh, qualifies for these kind of statewide credits. Um, this is what's, uh, these are the things that the Maryland legislation basically does at this point. And it, it really, I mean, the key thing in my mind is on the commercial applicator side, you really have a good mechanism for verifying, you know, not only how much they're overall applying, but how much they're applying in individual um, amounts, as well as all the other practices, which presumably they're controlling on the lawns that they're treating. Um, so again, in Maryland, um, you know, if you're on the commercial side and you're in the, the blended credit, you, you'd get, um, you know, a full, that's the full blended credit for the commercial application. Uh, because the Maryland um, legislation also affects the amount and content and form of, of uh, nitrogen in the bags, uh, uh, we're also, uh, uh, proposing or, or, or they're, they're gaining here a credit, but it's half of it on the um, do-it-yourself side because there's really no mechanism, again, back to how do you really verify that. I mean, you could, you could take those bags and misuse them potentially. I don't think that's widespread. So anyway, uh, that's sort of being credited down. And so I know if you look at the, the total picture then, um, um, I know one local government uh, person had expressed to me the interest in seeing that the urban nutrient management credits be as statewide as possible, sort of tracked and whatnot. So certainly in Maryland, that's what we have both on the phosphorus and the nitrogen side. In the other states, uh, we currently have it on the phosphorus side, as we noted. Um, and uh, potentially uh, uh, on the nitrogen side, uh, even without uh, legislation, uh, you know, they potentially, states can um, achieve a credit if they can uh, actually track their fertilizer sales over time. And actually this tracking mechanism um, is, is gonna be uh, critical really to maintaining all the statewide credits, both on the phosphorus and nitrogen side. From a verification standpoint, that's what we see as uh, sort of the, f the final proof of the pudding, not just that you, you know, you have these labels on the bag and you have these things saying that thou shall not fertilize uh, at greater than X rate kind of thing, but that you track it relative to your baseline, uh, your fertilizer sales over time, and, you know, based on that, you can basically compute your credit. Um, so again, just basic model dynamics, uh, nitrogen's somewhat similar and somewhat different than phosphorus. There's a bigger um, uh, non-fertilizer component, particularly atmospheric deposition uh, to nitrogen pervious um, land in the model. Uh, so that, again, if you uh, um, decrease your, your amount of fertilizer sales, or in this sense, applied, 
Uh, by 10%, it leads to a 3% decline in load. So again, statewide, if you're tracking it, that's what it would do. And again, those credits would flow out uh, presumably to all pervious land um, for all the, you know, the local governments in that state. Local governments themselves wouldn't have to track it. Um, so I'm going to end it there. So it's a mix, again, of these urban nutrient credits, which would be tracked at, say, a local level, uh, with these statewide credits, which are flowing out of the, the legislation and the dynamics of fertilizer content in the sales.